Hi everyone, so glad you're joining us today. We're looking at this amazing account of Daniel and his friends who were living for God in the most godless society in history, uh, Babylon. It was the new superpower under the tyrant king Nebuchadnezzar and uh, Daniel and his three Hebrew friends were taken into captivity and exile. They would never see their homes again. They would never sleep in their beds again. Uh, they would live out their days in the pagan nation of Babylon. And when King Nebuchadnezzar had returned to Babylon with all of these slaves that he had collected up from all the nations and conquests that, that they'd conquered all over the world, he had some work to do, the king did. I mean, he, he, there's some challenges in trying to build a cohesive society with people from such a variety of backgrounds and cultures and religious traditions. And so we sometimes act like we're the first ones to ever have to try to figure out multiculturalism, but we're not. Nebuchadnezzar faced it a long time ago and he decided to try his hand at unity by just getting everyone to forgo their native religions and just worship him instead. Sounds like a terrible idea to us, but to Nebuchadnezzar, he thought this was a fantastic idea. And, and in that culture, the only thing that mattered was what Nebuchadnezzar thought. So one day from the bullhorns inside the thick walls of Babylon came the decree that everyone in the city, today is the day for a field trip. Everybody make your way out of the city walls and into the plains of Dura. It was a few miles journey, and so people stopped whatever they were doing. They obediently walked through the city gates out in parade fashion toward Dura. And as they approached, they could see a, a, a huge tower in the distance, the hot sun reflecting off this solid gold statue. And it was a carnival atmosphere. People from all over the known world had gathered for this mysterious occasion. Imagine July 4th in D.C. Yeah, there was a, a stage filled with musicians and heads of state shaking hands and posturing for this big crowd. Maybe some 200,000 people or so in attendance, but people are thinking, you know, well, what's the occasion? Why are all these dignitaries here? What are we celebrating today? So I want to pick up the story in Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. It says this, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth, breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of of Babylon. Now let me just say a couple of things about this. Remember, last week we heard about Nebuchadnezzar's crazy dream that Daniel interpreted. Daniel had described a tower of all the kingdoms of the earth, and King Nebuchadnezzar, he was the gold head, and then there was silver and bronze and iron and clay. And Daniel said that all of these kingdoms would crumble one day because of their shaky foundation on clay mixed with iron. And so when Nebuchadnezzar heard the prophecy, remember, he was like close to getting saved last week. He fell to his knees. He declared allegiance to the God of the Israelites. Well, that was short-lived. He conveniently forgets about God and that living stone and the kingdom of God that's going to one day fill the earth and crush all the earthly kingdoms. That was Daniel's point of, of, of his interpretation. But apparently the only thing that Nebuchadnezzar remembered that was that he was the head of gold and he wanted to be the greatest. And so Nebuchadnezzar says, I have a good idea. I'm just going to build the whole darn thing out of gold. That, that'll strengthen it. That'll prolong my time in power. It will bring unity to all these people from all these countries because they're all going to bow down to me. Now, he's not exactly a model of sanity, you know, or humility, but, but he builds this tall statue, 60 cubits by 6 cubits, is about 90 feet tall by 9 feet wide. Ironically, similar dimensions to, to the Christ the Redeemer statue in Brazil, so just kind of picture that in your head. And it's no accident that it's 60 by 6, because the number 6 has some connotations in the Bible. The number 6 is often used when speaking of man-made efforts in opposition to God. So remember Goliath, who fought David. He was six cubits tall. He had six pieces of armor. The head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. Nebuchadnezzar's tower here is represented by a bunch of sixes. And you've also certainly heard of the Antichrist from Revelation 13, whose number is 666. And so we're supposed to understand that this statue was created by Nebuchadnezzar in opposition to God. And so all the people are gathered, all the officials are gathered, the orchestra is at the ready, and an announcement comes from the stage. Look at verse 4. It says this, And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, 
O peoples, O nations and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, every kind of music, you're to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the people's nations and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And so the music starts and the people, as you heard, are highly motivated to bow down. A little translation of verse 7 reads, as soon as they were hearing, they were falling. You know what that is? That is fear. When I think of one of the main weapons that a godless society has at its disposal, it's the weapon of fear. And guys, listen, we have been stead, uh, fed a steady diet of fear. If you're a politician, peddling fear gets votes. If you're an advertiser, fear sells products. And the architect of all of it is not people on the other side from you. It's Satan himself because he knows fear divides us and fear ultimately destroys us. I've seen more fear in the past three years than my entire previous 27 of, uh, years of ministry put together. Fear, it seems like, is underneath everybody's first reaction. Fear about COVID, fear about the vaccine, fear about the government trying to control us, fear about racism, fear about fascism, fear about Marxism, fear about immigration, fear about World War III, fear about the economy, fear, 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 fear. It's like everyone is right on the edge of fear all the time. Why? Because fear moves the needle. But as Paul reminded Timothy, so, so I remind you, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love, and of a sound mind. Do you know the most often repeated command in the Bible is not love each other, it's not serve the poor, it's not serve God, it's do not fear. He says it over and over again. And so Nebuchadnezzar announces the decree, kneel or die. And in fear, as soon as they were hearing, they were falling. That's how quickly they responded. The reason I want you to note that is because you're about to see a contrast with Daniel's three friends. They did not choose a fear response. They chose an obedience response. They chose a power and love and sound mind response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego take their stand. And I want you to think about what these three guys had been through. Like these young men were ripped from their homes. They were ripped from their families. From, they were marched off into a foreign country. They had served God the best they knew how with formidable courage. And then they were sentenced to death last week in the whole dream interpretation fiasco. And they narrowly escaped. And in the end, actually, they were promoted. And so they were learning how to walk this line that we all need to learn, by the way, between loyalty to God and respect for our earthly leaders. And when those two things seem to conflict, we have to choose our battles very wisely. So when they heard the edict about bowing down to an idol of gold, there in that huge crowd in the plains of Dura, they probably huddled up the three of them just for a second. They decided they could never bend the knee. They could never give their devotion to any god other than the god of heaven. And they must have hoped, like they must have prayed that it would never come to this. Like maybe they prayed that this decree wouldn't be enforced, but it was. Maybe they prayed that, that because of Daniel's influence, and the, the Jewish people might be excused from this, but they weren't. Maybe they prayed that when, when the moment came, when the music played, nobody would notice that when they failed to bow. But people noticed, and they made it known. So, so these three guys, they found their, themselves in their worst-case scenario. Every avenue of escape had been closed to them. And so they're faced with a dilemma. Obey the godless king or obey their God. And some of you may have a similar dilemma of obedience today. Will I do this unethical thing that my company expects me to do? Should I act on my sexual urges that my body wants me to do? Or should I do it God's way? Should I go skiing every Sunday like my friends want me to do? Or, or should I commit to, to taking my family to church? Should I scroll my phone all evening like my exhaustion tells me to do? Or should I spend time with my family? Like, what's your test of obedience? I want you to look at what happens when these, three, these Hebrew teenagers have their obedience tested. Look at verse 8. It says, therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They, they declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. 
They do not serve your gods. They do not worship your golden image that you have set up. And so imagine being there. Put yourself in the story. Nebuchadnezzar is basking in the glory of this new tower, his newfound fame, the prospect of people from all over the known world, every tribe, every tongue, bowing down to his idol. If you've ever been to a, a, a football game at Penn State in Beaver Stadium, you know, it seats about 107,000 people. So imagine that whole stadium filled with those people, along with the entire field filled with people standing shoulder to shoulder with each other. So that's the, the crowd size. There's a little stage and the orchestra starts to play, probably Sweet Caroline if it's in Beaver Stadium. Well, but the music starts to play and that's everyone's sign to bow down. So imagine in that stadium, across that whole sea of bodies, everyone bowing down on their faces, except three people standing there. Like put yourself there and ask, what would you have done? Like I, th I think we've become good at blending in with our culture. I think we've become experts at justifying our disobedience. We've become chameleons with those around us. Think of how easy it would have been when that music played for, for them to just pretend something, pretend they found a quarter on the ground. They're like, oh, hey, what's that down there? <laughs> or, or, or that day they conveniently wore the, the pair of sandals that always comes untied and the music comes on and they're like, oh, these darn sandals. You know, I'm always having to lace these things up and they just go down to blend in. Or it would have been so easy to look around and just say, well, you know, Every other captive from every other language and every other country is doing this. Everyone is bowing. They're surely not really renouncing their religions. They're just going through the motions to appease old Nebuchadnezzar. It's the cost of doing business in Babylon. It's just this gray area. So, so, so like you just sometimes justify, you know. Well, this is just something I need to do to get ahead in this culture, to get ahead in my company. Everybody does it. Ever talked yourself into that one at your job? Or they could have just said, nobody's really watching. Like the whole, the whole Jewish contingency is way over on the other side of the stadium. They're doing their own thing. No, nobody's going to know if I bow or if I don't bow. This is no big deal. I'm not hurting anyone. Have you ever used that one? Nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to care. It's not hurting anyone, even though God said not to do it. Or how, or how about, God will forgive me if I just do it this, just this one time. Like, he, he wouldn't want me to be ostracized. Like, these are the people I'm supposed to be reaching. He wouldn't want me to ruin my witness by, by being the weird guy that stays standing in this moment. He wouldn't want me to risk my reputation for this. Everybody, everything's going to go back to normal tomorrow. God will understand. And so I'm, I'm just going to bow down on the outside, but God will know that I'm standing on the inside. That's what I've titled my sermon today, Standing on the Inside. Because so often we take this approach. We think our faith is something that's private. It never has to go public. No one needs to know I'm a Christian. We become compromisers. We become chameleons. We often try to look as much like the world as we can in our relationships, in the entertainment we consume, in the way we talk, the things we value, how we approach the ladder of success, our, our choices. We think that, that we can bow on the outside to all of those values of our culture. We can bow to the world's sexual ethic. We can bow to, to crooked business practices. We can bow to holding grudges. We can bow to revenge. We can bow to fitting in with others through gossip and slander. But we convince ourselves that we're somehow standing for God on the inside. Inside is the spiritual stuff. That's the private stuff. That's the Sunday stuff. That, that's something that I, that I do on the inside, but, but it really doesn't leak out into the outside of my everyday life. It doesn't work that way, guys. See, see when you're willing to compromise, you, you can always find an excuse. And so what would it look like for you to obey God, even if it means a, a relationship might end, or you'll lose your job, or you have to get rid of that computer in your basement? When's the last time that you obeyed God, and it actually cost you something? My big idea today states that God is looking for people who will stand tall in obedience, not just on the inside, but on the outside too. And so these three men, they obeyed God in the face of unbelievable societal pressure. And I want us to look more closely at verses eight through 18 because I think we can really learn from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego these five ingredients of bold obedience. Hey, you like that? See that? It's not true unless it rhymes. That's what they taught us in pastor school. Anyway, here we go. The first ingredient of bold obedience is this. It's to recognize your idols. The reason that these three took a stand is because they were being asked to bow to a known idol. And in verse 12, they told that their accusers told the king these words. They said, they do not serve your gods or worship the golden image. So, 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 so they recognized the idol and they drew their line in the sand accordingly. 
And before you're like, whew, you know, I don't have any statues in my backyard that I'm bound down to. Let, let me explain. Our approach needs to be a little bit more nuanced. Generally speaking, an idol is anything that you love, trust, and crave more than God. It's the thing in, in your life that becomes too important to you. Those things that demand your ultimate trust or they demand your ultimate loyalty. Tim Keller wrote a piece called Identifying Your Idols and he says that so often we identify our idols as things like money or success or cars or whatever. But that identification process doesn't go deep enough. He suggests that there are four root idols beneath all of those surface ones. And the four root idols are these. Power, a longing for influence or recognition. Control, a longing to have everything go according to my plan. Comfort, a longing for pleasure and approval a longing to be accepted or desired. And so for example, some people might identify money as an idol, but they probably won't change until they acknowledge and confess and repent from the root idol, which is probably actually not money at all. Because for some people, money is about comfort. It's about achieving an easy life. For some, it's about approval. It comes from running in the right social circles. For some, it's about control, like leaving nothing to chance about your future. For others, it's about power. It's getting to a position where you can call all the shots. But that root idol, that, that, is the, that is the one that's very important to identify. So you ask, well, why has this relationship become too important to me? Why am I fixated on this promotion so much? Why do I feel like my life is over when I get rejected in any way? Why am I, why am I afraid to take this stand or to make this decision? Well, the issue probably isn't in that thing. It's probably underneath it. You're probably bowing to an idol of comfort or approval or control or power somewhere underneath there, and it needs to be dealt with. And listen, we, we always think of idols as things that are inherently evil, like greed or crack cocaine. <laughs> but for some people, idols come in the form of really good things, like family. I see parents all the time make their kids their idols, that they're bowing at the altar of trying to make their kids constantly happy or constantly successful or to keep their kids constantly safe. And it can usually be traced back to one of those four root idols in the parent. So I imagine Daniel's three friends wrestling with comfort and approval in these moments. I imagine them thinking, you know, it'd be way more comfortable right now to just bow down than it would be to keep standing. Much easier to seek approval from the king and from our peers in this crowd versus approval from God. But they chose to keep God on his throne. They recognized the idol for what it was, and they remained standing in obedience. And so it's important to recognize your idols. The second ingredient of bold obedience is this. It's to understand that people are watching. Did you see what it said in verse 8? It says, they maliciously accused the Jews. People were watching their every move. And these boys stood anyway. They were willing to be set apart. They were willing to be discovered, to be found out. And again, I find it instructive to consider what they didn't do. They didn't make any speeches. They didn't make any kind of a scene. There was no attempt to stop others from bowing down. There was no finger pointing. There were no press conferences. There was no violence. There was no resisting arrest. There was no running away. No lying about their actions. No claiming their constitutional rights. No attempt to overthrow the king. When they disobeyed, they did it openly, quietly, and submissively. And Nebuchadnezzar probably would have never noticed them if these snitches hadn't come forward. But people were watching. It's no surprise who is watching and why. It says it was some of the Chaldeans. You'll remember them from the last chapter. These were the ones who couldn't figure, figure out the king's dream. These were the ones who were showed up by Daniel and his friends and then skipped over for the promotion. So, so there was jealousy, there was bitterness, there, there were grudges here. If you're openly a follower of Christ, you can be sure that a whole host of people will be watching your every move. It happens the moment you set yourself apart as a Christian. And people will start going, ooh, I thought you were a Christian. Would a Christian say that? Would a Christian do that? Would a Christian watch that? We should welcome that kind of scrutiny and then live up to it. People are watching your life. Your kids are watching you. Your coworkers are watching you. Your family's watching. Your friends are watching. Your neighbors are watching. So just, just own it. I'm not saying, please understand, I'm not saying be weird for the sake of being weird, but be holy. Set an example. Be the first to love. Be the first to forgive. Be the first to stand up for what's right. Stand up on the outside, even if it means a little criticism. Be willing to be found out for your faith and stand anyway. Now, look at verse 13. <clears throat> it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. And so they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you're ready, when you hear the music, 
to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you should immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Here's the third ingredient of bold obedience that I want you to see. It's to be persistent in your courage. See, first the the Chaldeans maliciously accused them, but then Nebuchadnezzar gives them a second chance with a clear warning. The beginning of verse 15, he says, now if you're ready, he's saying, the first time you must have just not been ready. Like maybe the music just caught you off guard. Maybe you were just mesmerized by my new gold statue. Maybe you, you caught the eye of a pretty girl in the crowd and you missed the cue. I'm not sure why you guys didn't bow, but I like you and I'm throwing you a lifeline here, boys. Now, if you're ready, if you're ready, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, I'm gonna cue the orchestra one more time just for you, this time in front of everyone with all the eyes of the whole crowd on you. Like you think not bowing the first time took courage. This is much harder. And then he reminds them of the consequence. He says, if you don't bow, you're dead. Then he throws in an interesting question, which actually becomes prophetic. He he asks, who is the God who can deliver you out of my hands? Now, he's not looking for for information. He doesn't want a name. This is a rhetorical question. He's really just making a statement, obey me or you're dead. But before the music even kicks in a second time, the boys respond. They say, no, 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 we have no need to answer you. They they didn't just possess one-time courage. They possessed persistent courage. They said, no, it wasn't a mistake. It wasn't a fluke. We weren't distracted. And we haven't changed our minds upon further reflection. Because for us, this is a matter of obedience to our God. We we didn't bow the first time, and we won't bow the second time. And you can threaten us all you want, but we will not let fear dictate what we'll obey and what we won't obey. They were persistent in their courage. So, so far, the ingredients of bold obedience are recognize your idols, Understand that people are watching you. Be persistent in your courage. And the fourth ingredient is this. Trust God to come through. They said, King, this conversation doesn't need to go any further. And listen, listen to what they say next. They said, even if you decide to throw us into that furnace over there, they said, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. This is a statement of remarkable faith. And the answer to Nebuchadnezzar's question, who's able to deliver you from my hand? They said, our God is able to deliver us. He's able to rescue us from danger. Our God is able. I I don't even know if it's possible for us as Christians to spend too much time reflecting on stories that teach this one truth. The God we serve, our God, is able They had already seen him come through in a mighty way when they refused the king's food back in chapter 1. They had experienced his deliverance firsthand when Daniel was given the proper interpretation for the king's dream in the last chapter. They had seen God do it before, and they trusted him to do it again. And guys, some of you are all torn up right now over a situation that you're facing or a decision that you're facing. And the reason is because you forgot. You forgot that God is able. You forgot that God has come through for you in the past. He's delivered you. And instead of turning to him again, you're taking matters into your own hands. You're trying to solve things in your own strength. Please listen to me. The God I know, that God is able. He's able to reconcile broken marriages. I've seen it. That the God I know is able to liberate people from addiction. We've witnessed it firsthand. He's able to heal damaged bodies and he's able to forgive the darkest sin. The God we serve is able to provide for the greatest need. He's able to guide with supernatural wisdom. He's able to equip you to perform ministries beyond your natural abilities. He's able to soften the hardest heart. He's able to bring home the furthest runaway prodigals. Our God is able and we've seen him do it. And some of you need to stand in obedience to our God today because he's able to come through for you, even if you're facing the fieriest of furnaces. You know, he never promised us immunity from trials. In fact, just the opposite. But you can trust him to come through no matter what comes. Here's the fifth ingredient I want you to see. It's to draw the line ahead of time. I love this. I think these are some of the three most stunning words in in this whole passage. They come in verse 18, right at the beginning. These three say, but if not. I think this is one of the great phrases of devotion in the whole Bible. They're saying, yes, we do believe that God is able to deliver us from the furnace. And you know, fire is a pretty good winning percentage against people over the years. 
We definitely believe, they say, that God can save us from the fire. And we definitely believe that God can save us from your hand, O king. Here's the words. But if not, in other words, even if God doesn't come through in the way that we imagine that he's going to, even if God doesn't rescue us from the furnace how we think he should, we're still not going to bow down. They weren't absolutely certain that God would spare them on this side of heaven, but they determined to obey either way, no matter how it ended. And so many Christians want to make deals with God. Lord, I'll stand up for you as long as I don't lose my job in the process. As long as my friends don't make fun of me. As long as I still get that promotion. As long as my reputation remains intact. But God doesn't make deals with anyone. God calls us to be obedient and to leave the results with him. God never promised an easy road. But he did promise to walk along every road with us. And his presence is the greatest gift of all. And that's why these three young men said, but if not, they knew God could save them. They had faith that he could save them. But they also knew he might have a higher purpose in mind that would require them to die. And so they didn't try to back God into a corner by demanding that he do a miracle on their behalf in a certain way. They accepted God's will in advance without knowing how things would turn out. They had already drawn the line of obedience. I'm sure they knew well the first of the Ten Commandments. You will have no other gods before me. So they're like, this is just clear. They wouldn't bow. They stood their ground. See, in order to obey God, I think it's so important. We must draw our lines of obedience ahead of time, before the moment of temptation comes. Two chapters ago, uh, along with Daniel, they, it says they resolved to not defile themselves. They made a resolution. They resolved. See, some moral decisions can't be made in the spur of the moment. Your, your emotions will take over, and your emotions will betray you. You have to decide ahead of time that you will not compromise in the things that matter. You have to decide that up front. Not every hill is worth dying on, but some of them are. And it's better to die on those hills than to slink off in shame, shameful compromise because you didn't have any courage. So what lines do you need to draw ahead of time? Be, like before you find yourself in a financial spiral, will you say, I'm, I'm going to do money God's way. I'm going to draw a line up front that says I'm, I'm not going into consumer debt. Or I won't spend money I don't have. Or I'll honor God with my first fruits. I'm going to draw those lines of obedience first and then let the chips fall. Or I'll draw my lines of obedience to God before the meeting with my boss when I'm tempted to compromise. Or I'll draw the line sexually in my relationship right up front before we hit the moment of temptation late at night on the couch in the dark. I'm going to draw lines of obedience before I click on that website. My parameters are in place. Before I pull into that fast food restaurant, before I take advantage of that employee, before that difficult situation presents itself, before I travel alone to a hotel room, before I slander that person behind their back, I will decide ahead of time that certain things are off the table for me. Now listen, we can't anticipate every possible scenario, but, but that can become an excuse and, and to not draw any lines. So, so these three guys, they knew the line, and they said, we won't bow. And yes, we think God is going to come through for us. But even if he doesn't, we know the line is still right here, and we won't, won't bow to the king's God. So those are the five ingredients of bold obedience. Recognize your idols. Understand that people are watching. Be persistent in your courage. Trust God to come through and draw the line ahead of time. Let me just challenge you with the next step. I would just ask you today to ask this question. Where are you standing on the inside when you really need to take a stand on the outside? Like what is that one spot that you can't seem to bring under the lordship of God's authority? Maybe you're afraid to surrender. Maybe you're nervous about the consequences of taking a stand. Maybe you're nervous about what it might do to your reputation or your relationship or your career. But I want to go back and just follow quickly the progression of this text one last time. Maybe it involves identifying your idol. Like go back through that list and say, am I being tempted by an idol of power or control, comfort or approval? Some, something winning out over God because of one of those four longings that are deep inside me. And then maybe you need to identify your crew. Like these three young men had each other. Maybe you need to, to send a text or to make a call or to set up a coffee or something and, and bring in some reinforcements. Bring in a trusted Christian friend, an advisor that can give you some outside perspective on this stand that you need to take or this thing that you're compromising on. 
Or maybe you just need to prepare, spiritually prepare to stand. Like, obedience doesn't just happen automatically. We never stumble into it. It takes spiritual preparation. So maybe some of you need to block out some time to really pray, to really fast, to ask God to lead you to a verse and memorize that verse, or decide where the line is ahead of time that you won't cross, and then obey him, obey him. Take your stand and obey him. Love you guys.